On the morning of June the 16th, the day before Calvi's death, Flavio Carboni arrived in London. Carboni is a multi-millionaire, yet this trip, he chooses to stay in a crowded public housing compound near Heathrow Airport as a guest of one, William Morris, whom a reporter confronted in the lobby. What was Mr. Carboni staying with you at the time that Mr. Calvi was found dead? Oh, you know, I mean, I can't discuss any more of this stuff. Why not? Don't want to Is it true you're a Freemason, Mr. Morris? Oh, heck. Believe me, old kiddies, come on. You Can know, you tell us why it was that Mr. Carboni came to see you in London? He's a friend of mine, that's all. He's a friend. But why did he come here rather than anywhere else? I have no idea. Ask Mr. Carboni. But how, how well did you know Mr. Carboni? Quite as well as I know you. How many times have you met him then? Twice. You met Mr. Carboni only twice? Only twice. And yet when he came to London, he chose to stay with you? I'll let you. Morris's refusal to talk prevents our knowing fully what Carboni did in London. Meanwhile, here in Zurich, Calvi's daughter is staying at her father's request, waiting to join the family in Washington. Calvi telephones and tells her to be absolutely sure to take the flight. He says he'll call again. He doesn't. Later, at this hotel, a woman who introduces herself as Mrs. Kuntz approaches Calvi's daughter and hands her 50,000 Swiss francs with no explanation. My father uh, had uh, indicated in a phone call that uh, this Mrs. Kuntz was uh, going to call my sister in Zurich. And then uh, this Mrs. Uh, Kuntz appeared at uh, my sister's uh, hotel. And what did she say? She said that uh, my father was in London, he was uh, pleased with the place where he was staying, uh, that he wanted to stay in a family, and that uh, uh, her husband was going to meet uh, with uh, him the following day. She told Mrs. Kuntz, or the alleged Mrs. Kuntz, the alleged told Kuntz. your sister yes. that Mr. Kuntz was going to meet your father, father in London yes. on the day that he died. Yes. That same evening, Calvi meets Carboni in Hyde Park. It is a stormy session, with Calvi apparently complaining about his hotel. Carboni asks Calvi to accompany him to the Hilton Hotel. Calvi refuses. He does not leave the Chelsea Cloisters for another 24 hours, until his death. Milan, Friday, June the 17th, Calvi's last day alive. He's been missing for over a week. A crisis meeting is summoned at the bank. The directors don't know where Calvi is and are informed by their auditors that 1.4 billion is missing from the accounts. They decide to fire Calvi from the presidency and call in the Bank of Italy. But in London, even before the directors meeting, Calvi was beginning to act strangely. Certainly, that day, Calvi seemed depressed. He got dressed, undressed, took off his jacket and trousers, got in and out of bed, and whereas he'd usually have a rest every afternoon, that day, he didn't. Later that day, at the bank headquarters, just as the crisis meeting is finishing, Calvi's personal secretary leaps to her death from a fourth floor window, leaving a note cursing Calvi. We don't know whether anyone telephoned Calvi in Chelsea Cloisters to tell him either about his being fired or the apparent suicide. That day, for the first time in his adult life, Calvi shaves off his mustache. But still, he has not acted like a man about to kill himself. Sometime between 11.30 and 1 a.m. that night, Calvi leaves Chelsea Cloisters. To believe that he committed suicide, we must accept that he traveled over four miles to Blackfriars Bridge and once there, found some scaffolding, which he could not see from the road. We must accept, too, that he happened to find several stray bricks, which he then put into his pants and in his pockets. We have to believe that somehow, past midnight, he found some convenient rope. And all this time, back in his room, he had enough sleeping pills to kill himself easily and painlessly. But perhaps that wouldn't have been as traumatic. How did you come to be out of the room at the time that Mr. Calvi disappeared? 
quali sono state le circostanze che hanno fatto che lei non era nella stanza quando si giocava e poi sul passo? No, I remember that Carboni came to see me and Calvi. Calvi was very depressed, very agitated, and he refused to go downstairs to meet Carboni. So you went to meet Mr. Carboni? Yes, I went on my own. Calvi wouldn't even consider the idea of leaving the apartment. And it was while you were with Mr. Carboni that Mr. Calvi left the flat. Yes, yes. During the time I was with Mr. Carboni was when I lost sight of Calvi. È stato il momento che praticamente ho perso di vista il signor Calvi. You see, if Mr. Calvi was murdered, it was very convenient that you, the man who was supposed to be looking after him, happened to be out of the room at the time he disappeared in the company of Mr. Carboni. I can't reply to this question, because whatever answer I give would be the wrong one. Before Calvi's body had even been identified, Vitor had left Britain. That evening, a private plane flew out of Geneva Airport for London. Calvi carried an attaché case with him everywhere. It was found neither at Chelsea Cloisters nor on his body. The case is believed to contain documents which prove his relationship with the Vatican, with E2, and with Italian politicians. We understand that when the aircraft left Gatwick Airport for Geneva only 90 minutes later, it was carrying an attaché case. The day after Calvi's death, Flavio Carboni left Mr. Morris's apartment saying he was returning to Rome. The apartment is four and one half miles from Heathrow Airport from which there were seven flights that day. Instead, Carboni traveled over 30 miles to Gatwick Airport from where there were no flights to Rome. He waited a while, then, inexplicably, flew to Edinburgh, and on the next day, to rejoin Victor in Austria. Mr. Sindona, do you believe that Roberto Calvi committed suicide? I don't believe it all that. I knew very well Calvi had strong nerves. In my opinion, he had no reason to, to commit suicide. If he did commit a suicide, uh, somebody uh, did convince him to commit suicide. Well, really, um, what can I... There's nothing I can say about that. And I don't have a Non posso dire. No. Whatever the answer, the Calvi affair has tainted the Vatican. Was it naive and cynically exploited? Or was it using a lax international banking system for political purposes? For 750 million Catholics, the Banco and Bruciano scandal is a terrible embarrassment. For the Catholic Church to be associated with that, even remotely and discreetly and anonymously, is a shame, is a shame, and brings the Church into ill repute, and it ceases to be a sign of salvation, and it should be a sign of salvation. Whereas this just makes the Roman Catholic Church, its clerics, its pope, its cardinals, the entire institution, just some more members of the human race clawing in the jungle. And that was not the will of Christ. Some of the questions surrounding the death of Roberto Calvi will be addressed next month in London. The case has been reopened, and a new inquest has been granted to Calvi's family. Whatever the outcome, Calvi's death has, however slightly, pierced the veil of secrecy surrounding some powerful institutions. International banking, governments on both sides of the Atlantic are investigating abuses of the system. 
P2. Its former head, Lizio Gelli, will soon be eligible for parole in Switzerland. He's moved his money out of Italy, or he is a wanted man. And the church. Archbishop Paul Marcinkus is still head of the Vatican Bank, and as such, he is off limits to Italian authorities. He will not grant interviews. However, I was able to speak directly with Archbishop Marcinkus on Friday. He refused comment on allegations of his role or Calvi's in connection with the scandal. However, he did say that the church is conducting its own investigation, and he revealed it may cover, among other things, the circumstances surrounding the death of Roberto Calvi. And as if to add to Archbishop Marcinka's troubles, the Wall Street Journal reported just today that his chief deputy, the secretary of the Vatican Bank, is under investigation by Italian authorities probing a $2.2 billion tax fraud scheme. The Vatican had no comment. Pope John Paul II recently asked that the Vatican no longer involve itself with banks engaged in speculative ventures. And as to politics, well, you remember that two years ago, the Pope forbade clergy in this country to seek or hold political office. But this is a Pope who cannot forsake politics. The attempt on his life has now been traced behind the Iron Curtain, raising speculation that he is feared as a political force in his native Poland. As to charges that his well-known support for solidarity may have included millions of dollars of church money, no comment from the Vatican. Next week, on Frontline, a program about the Pentagon. We call it Pentagon Incorporated. The biggest build-up since World War II is underway. The Pentagon gravy train is coming. Two hundred million dollars will go directly into Indiana in just the aircraft carrier program. But how is the Pentagon shaping the nation's industrial future? And what is the price we're paying for rearming America? Pentagon Incorporated. It is next week on Frontline. Join us. I'm Jessica Savage. For a transcript of this program, please send $4 to Frontline, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for Frontline was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, by this station and other public television stations nationwide, and by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies for over 100 years, providing worldwide business and personal insurance through independent agents and brokers.